Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. I know this is not a continuation of my message last week, but it just really God just laid on my heart to preach on something different today. Uh, to be honest, it's something I'm going through in my own life. Uh, and the truth is all of us are going through it every day, every day of our life we're going through this. And uh, we need to grow constantly in this matter of trusting God, trusting God. And so I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter 3. And uh, it's a very familiar passage. Many of us probably can quote some of it. But let's go ahead and stand and we're going to read verses 1 through 12. 1 through 12. It says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thy heart, so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thy increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. And Lord, I thank you that we do have some air conditioning, Lord, and it's a little bit cooler in here than it is outside. Lord, we do thank you for the rain and the sun and how it makes the plants grow and Lord, the food that we receive. And Lord, we don't want to be complainers, Lord. Lord, we do thank you for your goodness to each one of us. Lord, I do pray that you would uh, be with this service, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would speak from your word to, to the hearts of each one of us. Lord, that you would give me clarity in the things I say, Lord, that would be an encouragement to those that hear. Lord, I pray that if there be one person here who has not accepted you, has not put their trust in you alone, Lord, that today would be that day. Lord, I pray for those that are listening, Lord, that they would hear and Lord, they would be encouraged. Lord, for those that are deployed from us right now, Lord, I pray that you would keep them safe. And Lord, bring them back safely here to Aviano. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, reach, speak to the hearts of the people here in Aviano, both Italians and, and Americans and all the other groups, different groups of people that are here in this area. Lord, I pray that you'd help us be a light to them. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness and all you're going to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. In the last few days, I have been considering trust and faith in Christ in, in, Christ in my own life. We use these, word, use these two words often together or even interchangeably when talking about our relationship with Christ. I have been studying these words in the Bible. It may surprise you that faith is a word used primarily in the New Testament and trust is a word used more commonly in the Old Testament. This does not mean that faith is not found in the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 11 clearly tells us that faith is found in the Old Testament when it gives us the roll hall of faith. It, it is equally true that the word trust is also found in the New Testament. So from this, we understand that faith and trust are connected very closely together. Let us start by trying to understand what each of these words mean and why God uses these two words separately. According to the dictionary, faith is the complete trust or confidence in someone or something. That's a very simple definition. I like simple, okay, so we'll keep it simple. Okay, trust, on the other hand, is a firm belief in the reliability, truth, or ability 
of someone or something. So there's a little bit of difference between the two words. Right away, we see that there's a connection. First of all, we see the connection between these two words. Because faith is defined as a complete trust in someone. In other words, it has to be trust for there to be faith. In the Old Testament, most of the Hebrew words translated trust mean, now this is interesting, it literally means to flee for protection or to be confident of the ability of your protector. That's really what the actual Hebrew word that's translated trust most commonly in the Old Testament means. So it has a picture, it has a picture of fleeing to someone that you believe can protect you. And this is a, there's a very good picture found in the Old Testament. It's found in Ruth. Ruth, the whole book of Ruth is actually a picture of someone who flees to the protection of someone that she believes can protect her. If you'll turn there, Ruth chapter 2, verse 12, I want you to listen to what, to what Boaz actually talked, she, the first time he meets her, basically, he actually says this about Ruth, about why she's there. So Ruth chapter 2, verse 12 says this, the Lord recompense, this is Boaz speaking to Ruth, recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. Come to trust. Ruth had fled to the protection of the Lord God of Israel who is being pictured here as a protective bird. And it's actually used several times throughout the Bible. The Lord describes himself as a bird who's protecting their chicks, their little baby birds, okay? To gather them together. We, we could ask here, from what was Ruth fleeing from, okay? Because if she's going to flee for the protection, Boaz says that she had fled or she was trusting in what? The Lord God of Israel. She had fled to the protection of the Lord God of Israel. So I, don't, I think it's a fair question to ask, what exactly had, had she fled from and why did she need the protection of God? The simple answer is the coming wrath. The coming wrath. The coming wrath. That's what she needed protection from. Specifically, the coming wrath of God. The book of Ruth is a picture of the kinsman redeemer. We actually studied it on Wednesday night back a few months ago. It's a very, it's an incredible picture of the kinsman redeemer of Jesus Christ. Okay. It's, and, and it's very powerful one. I love the book of Ruth. It, it helps us understand exactly what Christ has done for us. Ruth, you got to remember, was a Moabitess and she was a Gentile like ourselves. She understood that the coming judgment of God was going to be upon the wicked. It might be instructive to remember that the account of Ruth actually happens not too many years after the conquest of the land of Canaan. In other words, the, the conquest of the land of Canaan by the children of Israel was very fresh in the memories of the Moabites and these people. And we know that, we know that because Boaz is actually the son who is the kingsman, he's actually the picture of the kingsman, redeemer, and of Christ. He's actually the son of Rahab the harlot who was in the city of Jericho, who hid the spies, and she also fled to the protection of the God of Israel and put her trust in the God of Israel. And so we understand that Boaz, it wouldn't have been very many years, even within one generation, that the land has been conquered. So we know that Ruth and her people had only recently seen the wrath of God poured out upon the wicked people who occupied the land of Canaan before the children of Israel. Ruth trusted in the God of Israel that he was able to save her from the coming judgment. You know, a lot of people say, well, did the Old Testament saints understand? Yes, they did. OK, they really did. They understood a lot more than we imagine they did. And if you know what, not only did they understand it, but the world understood it. See, this idea that somehow everything's hidden and nobody knows what was going to happen in the past and it only became revealed when Christ came, just put that away someplace that's not true, okay? Mankind has always known. And you know what? Mankind knows today. You know, people say, oh, well, you know, how do they know? Trust me, they know. 
especially today, okay? But even back in the Old Testament, if you read your Old Testament and you don't just read it through, you're going to see that people understood the wrath of God. They understood the penalty of sin. They understood this. That's why all the false religions, all the gods, if you go back and read the history of all the gods, this is a rabbit trail here, but if you go back and you'll study the history, read ancient history, you know what you're going to find out? Listen, people were always concerned about the wrath to come. Now, it doesn't mean they chose to accept the truth, but they were always concerned. And today they're concerned too, and they're trying to find a way out of it. They may not understand it like we do, but they do understand it's coming. Today, over 3,000 years later, sinners still come in faith or complete trust in Jesus Christ for redemption. We are still fleeing from the wrath to come. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Death is coming because death is the penalty of sin. And we have all sinned against God. It is not surprising that man has, is, and will continue to search for the fountain of youth. They're still looking for it. Just turn on your news someday and listen to the health news. And let me tell you, they're still looking for it. You know why they sell so, you know why you can go down to, you know, like DM or, or what do they have here? They have um, Tulupiana. Is that how you say that? Tulupiana. Yeah. I, it's a, yeah, it's the, you know, you go there and you know what that whole store is full of? Cosmetics and shampoo and everything else. You know why it's full of that? Because everybody wants to look young. Everybody's trying to stave off death. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do your best to look good. Okay, I'm not saying it's wrong to look good. But you understand that everybody is looking for the fountain of youth. Everybody takes, you know why there's so many, you know, what do you call it? Vitamins and supplements and all. You know why that's such big business? Because everybody's looking for the fountain of youth. But unfortunately, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. And man's greatest fear is death. We might, we strive mightily to escape its inevitability. Wow, my mouth is dry. <laughs> it's inevitability. Ruth understood that her only hope of escape was to flee to the God of Israel. He is our only hope of escape from the coming judgment. Romans 6.23, most of us know this by heart. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Acts 4.12 says this, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I trust in Jesus Christ for my salvation because, and I want you to get this, this is the key difference between true biblical Christianity and any other, because he is alive. He is alive. That's the difference. Jesus, listen, Jesus is alive. He's not hanging on a cross. He's not dead in a grave someplace. He is alive. He took my sins to the cross. He paid for my sins with his own blood. God was satisfied with his payment for my sins. Why do I have complete confidence? That's trust in Christ. Because he is alive. If he was not alive, then God was not satisfied and my sins were not paid for. There is no other human being, and I stress that because he is, Jesus Christ, is completely human and he's completely God. Brother Ralph talked about that in Sunday school. It's, it's, it's what sets apart the truth and falsehood. Jesus Christ is a human being. 
He had to be a human being to die for us. You, God couldn't die for us. A human being had to die for us. That's why it's so important that Jesus Christ is a human being. He arose from the dead on the third day. He's sitting at the right hand of God today alive. There is no other human being, like I already said, human being who has ever risen from the dead to eternal life. This is why I and most people here today have fled to him for protection from the wrath to come. Before we go on, let me tell you a bit of the good news. There is always room for more. Listen, can I tell you that God's always got more room under his wings. He hasn't run out of room. He just gets, spreads those wings out further, okay? Everybody can come. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We have a whosoever gospel. It's not limited to a certain group of people, a certain nationality of people, a certain color of people, a certain group of people who speak one type of language or not. It's for everybody. Amen. You do not have to wait today to the end of the service. You do not have to wait for a vacancy. You can place your trust and faith in Jesus Christ right now where you sit today. You don't have to wait. The Bible says, call to Jesus today. Do not wait. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and tell him you are trusting in him for salvation. He will take you under his wings and he will save you from the wrath to come. John 6, 37 says this, all that the father giveth me shall come to me and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Salvation is the beginning of our trust in Jesus. However, our trust at salvation is just the beginning of a life of trust in Christ. In our text in Proverbs chapter 3, there are two verses that are well known to those who have been believers for a while. They are verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Many of us know these verses by heart, but what do they really mean? Do we, how do we practice them in our lives? In the next few minutes, we will look at five areas of our life that we can practice trust in God taken from our text. So I want you to look at the first one. Trust God's word. Trust God's word. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It says this, My son, forget not my law, but let thy heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Now, the thing that struck me as I read this passage was this. That if you read it, it's all, in chapter 12 of Proverbs, it's all one basic subject, all the way from verse 1 to verse 12. But the truth is, we usually just look at those two verses, and we never consider what comes before and after. And that's why we're going today. I want you to look at what's actually listed there, and you'll see that they come in two parts. You'll see that there's basically a statement of trust, and then there's a statement of reward for doing what told, you're told to trust him. The subject is trusting God with all thy heart. That's what the whole subject of this passage is. So if we look at this first one, we understand trust in God's word. Remember, trust means a firm belief in the reliability, truth, or ability of someone or something. So when we say trust God's word, we mean to trust in the reliability of God's word, that it is God's word. Verse 1 tells us not to forget God's word. If we trust God, then we are going to be reading God's word. You know, how do we know if we're trusting God? Are you reading God's word? First, first question you have to ask yourself. 
If you're trusting God, you're going to be reading his word. If we trust God, then we are going, we're going to be faithful in that reading. But that, and, and to be honest with you, that's convicting. I don't know about you, but that's convicting. Because I don't read God's word. You say, you're the pastor. You should be reading God's word more than everybody else. I don't read God's word as much as I should. I don't think, I, you know, I'm just being honest. And if you're honest, you'll say the same thing. Because the truth is, we can always read more of God's word. How much do we trust God? Do we really trust him? How much are we reading God's word? If we're not reading God's word, we don't trust him a whole lot. We don't have much confidence in it. We don't really believe that it can change our lives. But not only does, the Bible, does that verse tell us that we should be reading God's word, but if you look, it says, but let thy heart keep my commandments. So not only are we supposed to be reading God's word, if we trust God's word, if we really mean what we're saying, then we should be reading God's word, but then we should also be doing what? We should be practicing God's word. Okay, we should be obeying God's word. You know, we can tell a lot about how much we really trust God by how much we read God's word. We can really tell a lot how much we trust God by how much we obey God's word. If we really trust him, we're going to read and we're going to obey. But we also see that there's a reward, and, and we're going to see this, I've already mentioned this, but we're going to see that in each five of these areas, there's a reward or there's an outcome from trusting God in this particular area. So if we're trusting God's word, we're reading God's word, we're obeying God's word, the Bible tells us in verse 2, these are the things that will be added to us for length of days and long life and peace shall be added unto thee. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody that doesn't want long life. Does anybody in here want to die today? I don't think so. Let's just be honest, okay? We all want long life. Well, you, do you realize, now just think about this in a very practical sense. If you will read God's word and you'll obey God's word, do you know what? Your life will be extended. Because doing things against God's word are, generally speaking, detrimental to your life. They are. OK, if you, you know, if you take and you abuse your body, you know what's going to happen to your life? It's going to get short. It's going to get short. Do you realize that even people who don't believe in the body, they don't want to, they don't put their trust in God. If they will obey the commands that God gives, you know what? They'll live longer. See, God's word is very practical. It's very practical. Uh, you, you do what God commands you trust in him you believe, read his word you live his word and guess what god gives you long life he gives you peace i don't know about you but i i like peace too there, there's some people that love to be hated all the time and want to be in trouble all the time but most of us like peace anybody in here not like peace i want to know because i don't want to hang out with you okay <laughs> i'm gonna stay away from you okay so listen listen <laughs> Remember this, you have a real enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And can I tell you something? They don't want what's best for you. But you know what? We can trust that God wants what's best for us. He knows what's best for us and he wants what's best for us. If you'll trust God in his, God's word and read it and do it, God will take care of you. So we see, first of all, trust God's word. The second thing I want you to see is trust God's way. Trust God's way. Proverbs chapter three, verses three through four. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thy heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Mercy and truth are God's way of dealing with mankind. Just think about that for a second. God's way of dealing with mankind is mercy and truth. We deserve death and hell, yet God gives us mercy and truth. The Bible tells us and again and again to forgive one another and to love one another. This is a way of mercy and truth. This is how we're supposed to live. The world tells us to get others before they get us. I mean, that's what they tell you. You know what? I mean? You don't, don't, don't give them a break. Get them while, you know, get them right now. Don't, before they get you. Okay? They tell us that to get 
what is best for us and not what's best for others. And, and I know we can say, well, not everybody says it, but a lot of people do. You know, even people, and you got to be careful about this, okay? We can get caught up in like doing, and I, I by the way, I, I'm glad that a lot of people try to do good things, okay? But do you understand, even that can be corrupt. There's a lot of people who do good things for the wrong reasons. There's a lot of people who do good things so that they can get praise of man. There's a lot of people that they're, they're trying to get their agenda across. I mean, we see it in politics all the time, don't we? A politician says, I'll give you this if you'll vote for me. Now, you might think that's a good thing. But is he doing it because he cares about you? No. No. <laughs> He's doing it because he cares about himself, okay? He wants to get elected. And the truth is, most of the time, it's not necessarily as good as you think it is. As a matter of fact, a lot of times, it causes a lot of suffering and pain down the road. It just sounds good today. So understand that it's, it's more than just being a good person. It's being what God wants us to be. It is interesting that the Bible tells us to bind Mercy and truth, what does it say? Bind them about our necks and write them upon the tables of their heart. That tells us that God's way is not normally the way of man. That's not natural. It's not the way we think. It's not the way we operate. God's way must be enforced upon our sinful hearts and lives. Be careful who you get advice about how to conduct yourself in life. Trust God and follow the way of truth and mercy. Don't follow man's way. The reward, the Bible says, the reward for trusting God's way is in verse four. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. This is very much like what many people call the golden rule. If you want mercy and truth from others, you need to have mercy and truth for them first. If you are forgiving others, others are more likely to forgive you. If you want others to be kind, you need to be kind to them first. Trusting God always, trusting God's way always results in favor, in the favor of God and man. And the reason I'm stressing that is because we live in a world that says just the opposite. And I got to be honest with you, sometimes if you have mercy and truth, if you practice mercy and truth, things may not initially turn out really well for you. If you're merciful to people, people may not understand that. Some people will even take advantage of you. But can I tell you, if you'll trust God's way and do it God's way instead of man's way, God will reward you. I promise you. Not because of me, but because God's word says so. I've experienced it though too. And trust me, it never fails. God never fails. Go his way. Trust his way. Number three, trust in God. Trust God in humility. I guess I could have said, trust God in the right spirit or trust God. There's a lot of things we could have said here, but look at verses seven and eight. Be, be not wise in thy own heart, eyes. I'm sorry. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. The greatest danger for a Christian is when they think they know more than God. Okay? Now, of, tr of a truth, we will never say that part out loud. We're never going to say, oh, I know more than God, okay? Well, you know, that's, that's totally anti-Christian, okay? We all have Christianese. You understand what I'm saying? We all know how to speak like a Christian, okay? But just because we speak like a Christian doesn't mean we're thinking like a Christian, okay? And that's important to remember. We all find ourselves here. However, you know, even though we would never say that out loud, we often place our wisdom before God's wisdom, how many times have we, and I'm including all of us, said in our hearts, yes, I know that's what the Bible says, but, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, at least I do. Okay, I'll put my hand up, okay? Confession is good for the soul. I'll put my hand up, okay? But, that big but is our pride and our own wisdom. Instead, 
trust God in humility. And in the fear of God, depart from evil. There will always be an excuse. Let me tell you something. There will always be an excuse to do evil. Man is very good about talking himself out of guilt. And that includes us as Christians. We're very good at excusing ourselves. Do not trust yourself. Trust God. Trust God. Trust in God is humbling yourself to his protection. Remember what I said? Trust is like what? Putting, fleeing to God for protection. That's what it is. And you know what? Humility, it requires humility to ask God for that protection. You know why people don't get saved? You know why people, why would people want to go to hell? Why would people want to suffer the judgment of God? They, 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 there's only one reason. Pride. Pride. Pride is the thing that takes most people to hell. As a matter of fact, I almost dare say it takes 100% of the people that go to hell is pride. I don't think I could be proven false on that statement. Pride. And in our Christian life, so, many, so much damage is done to the cause of Christ through pride. Prideful preachers, prideful Christians, prideful members. Pride. Pride destroys so much. God wants us to trust him in humility. To trust God, we must humble ourselves. Humility is the opposite of pride and the companion of trust. The reward of trusting God in humility is, I like what the Bible says, health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Can I just kind of, that's kind of poetic if you understand what's going on here. Your navel is right here. He's talking about that you're going to be strong, healthy in your body. Marrow, what does marrow do? You know, that's where the blood is basically processed and it gives you the iron and everything that you need for life. Where is the blood? Where is the life according to the Bible? The life of the flesh is where? In the blood. In the blood. And since the blood comes from the marrow, it's finalized. You understand there's actually several processes that take place, but it's finalized in the marrow, the bone marrow. That's why a person who has leukemia dies because they cannot produce the red blood cells they need. And so you understand that when the Bible says that, it's talking about the strengthening of your life. In other words, if you will go in humility, your life, your walk, your strength, your life will be strengthened and help will be in your life. In other words, not just your physical life, but your whole life, your spiritual life, your physical life, your mental life. All those things will be strengthened if you will trust God in humility. In humility. Number four, trust God's supply. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thy increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Do you know what giving to God is? And I know I'm not, it's a rhetorical question, so you don't have to answer, but just think about it in your mind. Giving to God is an act of thanksgiving and trust. It's an act of thanksgiving and trust. Think about it for a moment. Does God really need you to give to him? No. I mean, no, he doesn't. He doesn't need you. Well, you know, the church needs it. No, God doesn't need your money, okay? Can, you, can I tell you something? God can take care of us without your money. God doesn't need you to give. So why does God command us to give back to God part of what he has given to us? The first reason. Our giving acknowledges that God has given us all that we have. It is a statement of thanksgiving for God's supply. It's acknowledging that everything we have comes from God. It is a statement 
like I said, a thanksgiving for God's supply. A giving person is a thankful person. Is a thankful person. If you stay here long enough, you already know that I don't spend a lot of time talking about giving. You know why? Because I trust that God is going to take care of the needs of this church. That's why there's a box back there and we don't pass the plate every week. Because I believe that God is able to take care of this church, whether you give or not. So the point that I'm trying to stress to you is why give? Why give? Second, so the first reason is because it's a statement of thanksgiving of God's supply. The second reason is our giving acknowledges our trust in God's ability to supply all our needs. A person who does not trust God will not give because they do not believe God is able to supply their needs. And you say, that's pretty harsh, but that's the truth. I mean, it's the truth, okay? We don't give because we don't believe God can take care of us. Because we're trusting in what? We're trusting in the money, not in God's ability. I'm not talking about giving to get. That's not what I'm talking about here, okay? Don't give so you can get, okay? That's not what God teaches. It's not what's taught in the Bible. I don't care what phony baloney pastor says that, okay? You do not give to get. You give because you trust God. And God has asked you to give. Giving is an act of trust. We give when we believe God will provide our needs. God will supply our needs. So trust God by giving to him part of what he has given to you. I've stressed this today because I want you to understand. I want you to give for the right reason. Like I said, if you if you don't want to give, you don't have to give. But you know what? Trust God in giving. Trust God in giving. Learn to take a step of faith, of trust in God. Even if it's just a little bit. Just a little bit. Trust God. Trust God. The reward for trusting God's supply is the blessing of the Lord in the supply of our needs and beyond. God will take care of those who trust in him. Now, the reason I'm saying you don't give to get, but understand the, the correlation here. As we trust God, God takes care, and I've stressed here, the needs. In other words, nowhere in the Bible does it say if you give to God that tomorrow you're going to have, I don't know, a, a Tesla, okay? That's, a, that's one of those bigger expensive cars nowadays. They used to say Cadillac. Most people don't even know what that is, okay? <laughs> a, a Tesla, okay? Uh, now you're going to have a five-bedroom house and you know all this other stuff, and you're going to have a million dollars in the bank, okay? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. If you read the Bible, do you realize that many of the saints of God had hardly anything? Elijah went to the brook, Kindred, Kid, I think I'll say that. Kidron. 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 You know what? Because he trusted God. Do you know what? God took care of his needs. You say, well, I don't want to eat food from a raven. And I want to drink out of a brook. But you know what? God took care of him, didn't he? Right. Then he went up to Zarephath. And there was a widow lady. It wasn't even a believer in God, wasn't even a Jewish person. He went to her and all she had was a little bit of meal and a little bit of oil. And she was going to make her last cake and she was going to die. Her and her son were going to die of starvation. But Elijah, you got to think about it, took trust on both parts. Elijah said, God's told me to come and I'm asking you to make a little cake for me first. Do you, do you realize what he was asking her to do? Take what you have and give it to me. She didn't know who he was. Didn't know, you know, if she had, she could have returned him in, maybe got a reward and had more food. You know, they were looking for him, right? He was, they had wanted posters up all over the place, you know, looking for him. I don't know if they had posters, but whatever they did back then. And they, uh, 
She could have maybe turned him in for a reward if she had known who he was. But instead, she trusted him. And she went and made a cake. And her and her son lived with Elisha, Elijah, many, many days, the Bible says. You know what? They didn't have a full container of flour. They didn't have a full container of oil. It's just every day there was a little bit of oil and there was a little bit of flour. And they just kept on trusting God. That's the kind of God we have. That's the kind of God that we can trust for his supply. The world may change. Our circumstances may change tomorrow. If we lose everything tomorrow in this physical world, we can still trust in God's supply. Trust him. Trust God's supply. And number five, trust God's correction. Proverbs chapter three, verses 11 through 12. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. As, parent, as a parent, I do not enjoy correcting my children, but I know I must if they are to live a life that is pleasing to God. Listen, you just can't let your children go and do whatever they want to do. You're not loving them. You're not loving them if you don't correct them. It is the responsibility that God has given to me. And even still, I can only do a partial job. I can't do a complete job. Because there's no way that I, they have to come to a point where they accept Christ by faith. And God changes them. I can only do what I can do as a human being. God, in verse 11, refers to us as his children. My son. Unlike our earthly fathers, God never makes a mistake in his correction. Those of us who have been parents, or even, any, even if we aren't parents, if we've been in charge of anybody, we know we make mistakes. We fail. We come short. God doesn't make any mistakes, mistakes in his correction and teaching. They are always right. Their purpose is always for our improvement and never for our hurt. Trust in God's correction. He only corrects those he loves. He loves all those who are his children. The reward of correction is simply this, to belong. To belong. To belong to the family of God. In Hebrews, it tells us if, if we're not corrected, if the Lord doesn't chasten us, we're not one of his. Listen, correction is something that families do. It's not something that strangers do. The reward, like I said, is to belong. And do you know that there is a whole world of people out here looking to belong to something? And you know what we desire greatest? We, we desire to belong to. To belong to someone. Trust in God and his correction as he molds us and shapes us into what he wants us to be. I've had to kind of rush through. I could have probably spent a whole message on each one of these, to be quite honest with you. But I've given you an outline that you can study more. We've looked at five practical applications of trust. Trust God in his correction. Trust God in his supply. Trust God in humility. Trust God in his way. And trust God in his word. Now quickly, I want us to think back to those two famous verses, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. It sounds so simple, yet in reality it is so hard. If we could just know what the future is, it would be so simple. At least that's what we think. If we could know what's going to happen tomorrow, we could be prepared for tomorrow. The reality is that we cannot know what is tomorrow, nor would it be good for us to know, to be quite honest with you. Okay? However, we have a God who knows tomorrow, and we can trust in him to take care 
of tomorrow. As believers, our lives are like a road. We know where we are today and we know our destination. Listen, if you put your faith and trust in Christ, you know your destination. It's in heaven one day. What we do not know is in between where we are today and our final destination. Yesterday, my family and I took a trip to a town in Austria. We went there for one of my children's birthdays. Someone, and I won't name who it was, someone told me that the road was flat and straight. And sometimes people tell that to new Christians. This is going to be a great time, okay? It's going to be flat and straight. I should have known better. We were going to Austria after all. Several hours later, after ascending over 4,000 feet, that's 13, 1,360 meters, and having driven through 35 switchbacks, we arrived at our destination. It was neither flat nor straight. That is the reality of our lives. You can either trust yourself to navigate all those turns and hills and end up in the ditch, or you can trust God to navigate all the hills, all the valleys, and all the curves that will come in our lives. Trust God with all your heart. If there's one person that will never fail you, it's God. He will never fail you. Trust in him with all thy heart. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. The only Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the fact that we can trust you. Lord, you know exactly where I am, Lord. And Lord, you laid this on my heart because I needed to hear this message today. Lord, the older I get, the more I realize how often things don't turn out the way we think they should. And Lord, how much we need to trust you. Lord, I just pray that you would be this time of invitation. I pray that you would encourage the believers, Lord. And Lord, if there's even just one person here today that has not accepted you, has not put their trust in you for salvation, Lord, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you to bow your heads and close your eyes. We always take this time. You're welcome to come forward if you'd like to, or you can be in your chair. But I want to challenge the Christians, listen, this is something I've been going through just in the last few weeks. It's, just, it's been a struggle, trusting God. You know, it's easy to talk about. It's not easy to live. Trust God. But I also want to talk to anyone here. I, I don't take it for granted. I know that we're regulars. But I never take it for granted that there might not be one person that has not come to that point where they put their trust in God. Listen, we talked about it at the beginning of the message. You can make that decision to put your faith and trust in God. He died for you. He loves you. Don't let pride keep you from trusting Him. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins today. Let Him know that you're trusting in Him completely. Ask Him to save your soul. Can I tell you, God, God's not, nobody's going to laugh at you. Nobody's going to think less of you. God loves you and he died for you. If that's you today, set aside your pride and humility. Come now or if you want to come after the service, but seek out someone that can share with you. Brother Ralph, Miss Patty, myself, my wife, really just about almost everybody here could share with you the gospel. Make the decision today. Christians, trust God.